he saved me. He saved me. He baptized me. Baptized I'm covered. Me. I'm Protects me. Protects I'm covered. Me. I'm covered by the blood. Oh, he guides me. He guides me. He provides for me. Provides I'm for covered. Me. Bye! 
because of you. I want to thank you and praise you too. Your grace and mercy brought me through. Brought me, brought me through. I'm living each moment. I'm living this moment because, because, because of you. And I want to thank you. Praise you too. And praise you too. Oh, your grace, your grace. Your grace and mercy. Lord, it did. Brought me Thank you for saving. Mm, a sinner like me. To tell the world salvation is free. Mm, there were times, there were times when I just didn't, didn't do right. But Lord, you watched over me, over me, both day and night. Oh, your grace, your grace. Brought me, brought me through. I'm living this moment. I'm living this moment. It's all because of you. Because of you. And I'm going to thank you. I'm going to thank you. I want to thank, thank you, Lord. Lord, and praise you too. And praise you too. Oh, your grace. It was your grace. Your grace and mercy. Oh, Lord, it brought me through. Just us demanded. That I should die. Mm, but your grace and mercy said, Oh no, oh no, oh no. You've already paid the price. You see, uh, I once was blind. Mm, I once was blind. And I'm thanking God I can see. It was because, because of your grace and mercy came along yes, it and it rescued, it rescued me. Oh, your grace. Your grace and mercy. It brought me, brought me through. I'm living each moment. Jesus, thank 
you, Jesus, and praise you. And praise you it was because of your grace. It was because of your grace. Your grace and mercy. Oh, your, your grace, your grace. Starting me out another year. Your grace, your grace. Waking me up this morning. Your grace. Oh, give thanks, oh, give thanks to, the Lord, to the Lord for all he has he done. Has done. Oh, give oh, thanks, give thanks to, the Lord, to the Lord for this race we, this race we've already won. We He's already done everything he would do. Oh, give thanks, give thanks to the Lord. 
Oh, oh, give thanks to the Lord for all he has done. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for this race we We've already won. He's already done everything he would do. Oh, give thanks. Give thanks. Oh. When I was hungry, Lord, you fed me, fed me with manna from on high. When I was thirsty, flowing water from the fountain that will never, 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 never run dry. When I was Lord, you came, then you wrapped your loving all around me. I just want to thank you, give thanks. Oh, when I was hungry, my God, you fed me. Fed me with manna, fed me with manna from on high. When I was thirsty, flowing water from the fountain that will never, never, never. I was lost. My God, you found me. Then you wrapped your loving arms all up. Put your loving arms all around me and I, I just want to thank you, Lord. Give thanks. Mm. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for all he has, he has done. Oh, give thanks. oh, give thanks to the Lord, the Lord. for this race we've, oh, race we've already won. We've already, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's already done everything he would do. Oh, give thanks. 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 Want to thank you for saving my soul. Want to thank you for making me whole. Want to thank you for picking me up. Want to thank you for cleaning me up. Want to thank you for dying on the cross. That my soul might not be lost. Want to thank you for laying down your life, delivering me from trouble and from strife. I I I I want to thank you. I I I I want to thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being so good. You gave me grace when I didn't deserve it. You shed your blood for me. When you died on the tree. You love me that you sent your only begotten son into this world to die that I might have a everlasting life forever. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. 
I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, real grateful, real grateful, real grateful, real grateful, overjoyed by your love and your goodness would not be didn't deserve it, didn't deserve it, didn't deserve it, didn't deserve it. Won't give thanks. Won't give thanks. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, give thanks, give thanks. Oh, give thanks, give thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For dying on the cross. For delivering my soul. Making me whole. There was not anything good about me that you should die, but you did it anyway for your love. For your love, I'm grateful, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks. Give him thanks. Give thanks. Give him thanks. Praise his name. Give him a thank to the to the to the that are part of the worship moment and that is when we congregate we come together and we come together to celebrate for we have something to celebrate for and then this morning we will be commemorating so from congregating, gathering, to celebrating, to commemorating. And who are we commemorating? Who are we celebrating? And his name is Jesus. Not too long ago, we talked about his birth. And now we are looking at him in terms of his sacrificial death and his resurrection. Somebody asked the question, how can that be? His purpose was coming, for coming was to die. He didn't come to live and to stay. He came to give his life as a ransom for men in the Bible is full of God's statements, and especially in the Gospel of John, where it tells us that his purpose for coming here to this earth was to save the sins of the world. Matthew makes mention of that in his first chapter. And I think it's verse 21 where it says, when the name was given to him at birth, and the angel told Mary, you will call his name, his name will be Jesus. And the name Jesus means that he will save his people from their sins. Let us say amen. amen. A couple of days ago, I was, I was just, well, you go through junk stuff, and especially for a minister, stuff that you write, half of it needs to be thrown in the trash can. But when you reflect back, some of it, 
you, you feel that you can reuse it again. And there was a prayer that I wrote out, and I don't remember when it was, where it was, but as I read it, it seemed to resonate in terms of my spirit. And it said in terms of what at that moment and even now that I feel. And I perceive that as a choir was singing, that many of you, as you join in, not because of the beat of the song, but because of the message of the song, what it was saying to you and how it elevated in terms of your spirit and the strife and the struggles that we go through down here on earth. I like to read this prayer and as a prayer, as an opening to our message. So let us all bow our heads together, please. Oh God, our Lord, how awesome are you. We praise you this day because you commanded in your word that everything that breathes should praise you. We come to you today with grateful and thankful hearts because your mercy is new this day. You have given us hands to show your mercy, hearts to extend your mercy, and then minds to reflect your mercy to others. It is in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray. May all of the saints of God say together, Amen. Our scripture that we would like to anchor around is, in, is found in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Hebrews the 13th chapter, the 5th and 6th verses, and this can be coupled with the verses in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And since all of us forget, well, many of us forget our Bibles, I think it is reflected on the screen, amen? So let us all stand <coughs> together. And let us read in unison the two verses in Hebrews chapter 13. Let us begin. Let your conduct, conversation, be without covetousness. Amen. So end of the reading of his word. You may be seated. In the New King James Version that I'm using this morning, the latter part of the fifth verse of the B portion says, and he's talking, the writer's talking about God. God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then couple that with Hebrews 11.1, 1, where the writer says that faith, and I'm reading again from the New King James, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. And then come down to the sixth verse, which we can join with that. The writer says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Talking about God. For whoever comes to God must believe that he is, that God is real, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I read the other day a story 
and he was talking about a minister who had been a missionary on a foreign field. And um, he had served for about 15 to 20 years. And uh, he was getting ready to retire. And his plans were that after he came back to the States, that uh, uh, he wanted to do some writing, reading, and some lecturing for the remainder of his future. But after a couple of days here in the U.S., he got sick and had to go to the doctor. And when they examined him, they found that he had cancer. And it changed all of his plans. And what he had thought about his projection in terms of his future I guess you can say that everything had to be on hold or some of it he might have thought would never come to pass. Not only did that happen to him, but that happens to a lot of people. And you don't have to catch cancer for your plans to be altered, to be changed, for living in this world and in this life. There's nothing wrong with planning, but don't ever think that your plans, that God is going to anoint them and everything is going to turn out exactly how you want it to. I've heard of people who retired from their jobs and who had saved up, in fact, this lady in our community about a block down the street had worked over 40-some years wherever she was working and had uh, money saved up by $50,000 in one KO, uh, 401k and then and another 100000 But anyway, after all of this and when she retired and she was looking forward to doing a lot of traveling and when she called in terms of those that were res responsible for these securities and found out somehow that somebody had hacked into the computer and had taken all of her money. Her plans were aborted. And that's still happening today. I want to raise this thought as a question from Hebrews 13, 5b, and then from chapter 11, verse 1. When it is difficult to praise, when it is difficult to praise. There are two questions that will act as a catalyst to empty into our, the main body of our discussion. And the two questions are this, how do we praise God in our circumstances? And then the other question is, what do Christians do when it is difficult to praise God? The first thing is we should praise Him anyway. We should praise God anyway. We can't wait until we feel like offering praise to God. We can't go on our emotions because emotions will deceive you. Your feelings will be like a roller coaster, be up and down. And you might feel like praising him maybe in that morning when you get up, but then later on that evening maybe you get a disturbing call and you don't feel too much like thanking him for having brought you through the day. We have to praise God as a daily experience. And that's something that the Lord is teaching me. And sometimes, you know, when God tries to get through to your heart and your head, sometimes there is blockage there, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, bleed through too well. But one thing about, about God's mercy and grace, He will keep on talking to you until that lesson comes through. And He's teaching me that every morning that I get up just to thank Him, for one more day. 
because he did not have to let me open my eyes to see that day. So I want him to know I'm grateful for one more day because there is no guarantee that he's going to let me see tomorrow as one more day. Now he's already brought me from yesterday as one more day, but this day is the only day I can say that God has given me another opportunity. And not only do I thank him for this day, but there were mistakes and decisions I made and let me use my grandma's language that I made yesterday that I don't want to make today. So I need uh, his forgiveness. I need him to give me the strength to be a better believer, to be stronger in my faith this day than what I was yesterday. We praise God, not for our circumstances. You don't praise God and thank him for your afflictions, for your problems, for your strife, what you're going through physically, mentally, and emotionally. We praise God for his nature. And let me repeat that again. We praise God for his nature. We praise him for his character, for his integrity for his steadfastness, for his unrelenting commitment to us. Let me say it this way. We ought to praise him. We must praise him for who he is. Who is he? He is a God that has come to give abundant mercy and grace. He is a God that is sinless. He is a God that says that if you believe in me and accept my plan of salvation, then you have eternal life. Nobody else in my life, nobody else in this world that I've read about in the past or the present or even looking forward to the future can give that statement as an ironclad commitment to anybody. Only Jesus Christ. Why? Because he doesn't lie. You know what causes me to lie and causes you to lie or to give a fib or, or to give a little white lie, pink lie, orange lie, whatever the case might be, is because of sin in us. There is no sin in Jesus. Therefore, Jesus does not lie. He won't tell you one thing and then do another thing. Again, let's go back to Hebrews 13, 5. I will what? I will never, never what, the word, what does the word never mean? <laughs> never. In other words, it will never happen in this life, nor even in the life to come. I will never what? Forsake you, which means he won't walk away from me. He won't abandon me. He won't act as though that he doesn't know me like Peter did there by the campfire when they were judging Jesus in the courtroom and they said, you belong to him. And, G and Peter said, no, I don't. I don't even know who he is. I've never met him before. I don't know nothing about him. He won't do that to me and to you. No, no. He won't do us like Peter. He will not deny us. He will not forsake us. Therefore, because of his character, his nature, we praise him. And whatever my circumstances are in my life, I know one thing, that he is my help, my guide, my rock, my shield, my strength, my power, everything that I need. How many of y'all love to listen to quartets? Well, we got a few quartet uh, lovers. Uh, there's a song that Lee Williams, with his group, sings. And the song is entitled, I Can't Give Up. I don't know whether you've ever heard that song before. But anyway, he talks about in terms of trouble on his left, trouble on his right, 
trouble that he has just left and come through, and then he's hoping that things will get better, so he looks ahead, and when he looks ahead, all he sees, he says, is hills and more hills and more hills and more hills. And every time I hear that song, I can identify with it. I, 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 all of my experience, I can say that when I look ahead, there might be maybe a bright spot today, but then I wake up in the morning, a dark cloud. So it's nothing but hills and more hills and more hills. But still, in spite of all of the hills and the more hills, I still got to praise him. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be forthright, and I'm going to be frank with you. Sometimes you're going to have to force yourself to praise him. Amen. You ain't going to feel like it. You ain't going to be jubilant all your life because that's not really what real life is all about. So even when you don't feel like it, you do it anyway. You make your mouth say, thank you, Lord. Even if your heart is cold at that time. And then pray like David prayed in Psalm 51. Lord, uh, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. I don't care who you are, how long you've been walking in the faith, every so often, every believer in Christ, you will get low on fuel in your life. And the fires and the embers that are burning in you one day will be nothing but a smoldering ember, uh, embers another day. And you have to ask God what? To rekindle that fire to let you feel that joy again. So we praise him anyway. The second thing that comes out of this thought is when praise is difficult. When praise is difficult to give. When it's difficult, remember the past. The memories of God's blessings years ago will help you to praise him now. What God has done for others Give an example. You go to the Old Testament and you read in God's word where the Israelites, God had chosen them, not because they were a perfect people, not because they were the best looking, not because they were the largest uh, nation on the face of the earth. God chose them because he loved them. Now that's as far as we can go. We cannot give an explanation for the heart of God and why he loves a sinner. All we know is he loved Israel. And because he loved Israel, he protected Israel. He, he, he took care of Israel. You remember as he parted the Red Sea? And he gave them water from a rock. He brought manna down from above. And even after they kept on grumbling and complaining and said they had bread, uh, let, let me, can I say it another way? They had cornbread, but they had no meat and gravy to sop it with. So he gave them quail, and the quails came now. And still after he did all of that, what was their response? They still were not satisfied. Don't you see yourself in that picture? Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. I'm going to say it for you. There have been moments in your life and my life when we prayed and God decided maybe to grant that request. And when we got it, we were satisfied momentarily. Then after that, something else happened. We start grumbling. But aren't you glad that when we grumble, God didn't say, now look here. You're like a small child. I've tried to what? I've tried to suit your fancy. And since you have done, since you've acted like this, I'm not going to bless you no more. That's the last blessing. Have, have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that? That when I'm not grateful as I ought be, then God says that's where he cuts the blessings off. But ain't you glad he does not judge me 
nor does he look at me according to the mess that's in me, but he blesses me because he loves me. I don't understand that kind of love, and in actuality, I know I don't deserve that kind of love because I don't see it here amongst me, amongst the people down here, among my family and everybody else. I see family love, I see friendship love, but I don't see the kind of love that loves people in spite of how nasty they are, how mean they are, how low down they are. I don't see that kind of love down here. And I'm glad, even though I may not be as sorted as some other sinners are, but still all of us, what, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I can't brag about nothing. I sin in my way, maybe silently, sins you don't know nothing about, and I ain't going to tell you. You'll never find out that's between me and him, but he knows about it. But every night when I lay down on my bed, I always go to the 51st Psalm, Lord, cleanse me of my iniquities. Wash away my sins. Restore unto me the joy of your, of your salvation. Create in me what? A clean heart. And give me your spirit. God has an abundant supply of grace to endure any difficulty that you and I might go through in our lives. And then the third thing that comes out of this thought, we must plan for future praise. We must plan for future praise. Sometimes, as I've said before, in this shell, this bag of dust that we inhabit, all of us feel low emotionally and spiritually. And when you are in that frame of mind, it's difficult to focus on the goodness and the greatness of God. It's like trying to fight through a fog, through a haze, through a maze. But the Bible provides for us hope, trust, and a response to God. For an example, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, and I'm paraphrasing this, Peter says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but long-suffering to us. Ain't you glad he's long-suffering? Ain't you glad? Say Amen. You ought to be glad he's long-suffering to you because think about what if he was short-suffering, a short-tempered, or just a little dab of patience. Like sometimes my patience wears out with my grandkids. What if he was that kind of God? What would he have done way before we got to this juncture in our lives? I have a feeling that basically this room would be empty and silent because our lives would have been cut off. He would have said, we don't deserve it, and I'm not going to let you go on any longer. But because he's long-suffering and he keeps his promise, then in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he says, we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises. I want you to turn over to Romans, the fourth chapter, and let's look at a promise that he gives not only to Abraham there, but to those who by faith have received the promise and we have become righteous in his sight. Fourth chapter of Romans and verses 23 to 25, and I'm reading, as I said, from the revised King James. Now, and it was not written for his sake, talking about Abraham, what has gone before, alone, wasn't written just for him, that it was imputed to Abraham as righteousness, but also this was put down for us. It shall be imputed to us, talking about believers, who believe in him, who is him? Jesus Christ, our God, who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, 
who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our what? Justification. Ain't that good news? Excellent news. Finally, even in tough times, we can ask God to use our experience for his glory. Now, never be grateful for the experience, for the illness, for the hard times. That's not what you're praising him for. Not that. You're praising him for in spite of what you are in and the mess that is swirling around you in spite of that he still deserves your praise because he's going to somehow we don't know going back to chapter 11 verse 1 faith is what the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen we don't know what God is going to do with my circumstance but I trust him because of what he has done with my circumstances in the past. And he either elevated me over them or carried me through them or opened a red sea, so to speak, so I could go right between them. And if he did it then, and if he is trustworthy, and if his character is, he'll never leave me nor forsake me, then I can trust him this moment to do the same thing as he did then. Amen? For he said, and I didn't ask him to give me that promise, I won't leave you, Bonner, and I won't forsake you. I won't leave you, Flint. I won't forsake you. Just put your name right there. And that's God's promise to you. But now, there's a qualifying comma there. Let me say it this way. You got to be in Christ. You have to have a connectedness with him. In other words, you got to be one of his children. That promise is not given to uh, the folk that are not children's. You got to be in the family. If you're a visitor, no. Stranger, no. But if you're in the family, don't worry. It's just like all of my grandchildren. Some of them have more pleasant personalities than others. Some of them get on my last nerve. Some of them even manufacture a nerve, and then they destroy that for me. But in spite of all of that, I love every one of them. And if there's anything that they need, I'll try to do the best I can within my limited power to help them or to encourage them. Do you understand where I'm coming from? All of us in the family ain't sweet cherries. Because we can look at one another. Sometimes we get tired of one another. And if we get tired of one another, how long has God been putting up with us? But he still loves us in spite of all and what we are. Sometimes a person might pray for health. And sometimes God might grant that request. But however, we can't expect God always to heal all of our diseases. He's not going to do that. For man that is born of woman, what? And what? Full of trouble. All of us are going to die one day. Do you understand that? Maybe somebody's thinking now, well, that's far off in the future. I don't have to worry about that until I get about 70 or 80. How do you know you're going to live that long? Who told you that your lifespan will extend that long? Only God knows in terms of how many more seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years and decades and millenniums that he's going to allow us to dot this universe that he has created. Amen? 
death comes to everybody. But we can say with Paul in the 8th chapter, which is my favorite chapter, Romans 8, beginning at verse 38. I'm going to start at verse 37. Paul says, all that we go through, tribulation, coming back up, before we get down to verse 35, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, a sword. In verse 37, Paul says, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Then he says, for I am persuaded, which means I'm convinced, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that neither death nor life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, any created thing shall what? Be able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Now those are comforting words. And you know what? Those words, be, they, they cannot just be something that you have memorized in, in, in your head. You understand where I'm coming from? Memorization is fine, but you're going to hit a bump in the road. You're going to hit a pothole in life. That, that verse of scripture that is up here is going to have to come down where? Here. And you're going to have to know it in your heart. If not, let me tell you, because you're not the only one, Satan will come to everybody. Hear what I said? Satan will attack your mind and he will bring thoughts to you and he will say, well, if God is so good, if he loves you so much, why doesn't he get you out of this mess that you're in? If he's such a great God, why does, why does he not keep this from happening? Why didn't he, what, reroute you around this? He's going to bring those thoughts to your mind. And when he does... You're going to have to know the Word of God. You're going to have to stand on God's Word. You're going to have to stand on His character and His nature. And you're going to have to say to Satan, like, like Jesus said to Satan that was using Peter, Get behind me! What I'm trying to say is, you got to know Him personally. Now the word is fine, but the word must become a reality. And the reality is that the word, what? Is the man that spoke the word. And it's not just words and letters and ink on paper. All of us in our lives are going to face similar trials. But we too must plan for the same response of praise by three things I leave with you and keynote this in your memory. First of all, remember God's nature. Remember God's nature. Secondly, remember God's past blessings. Remember God's past blessings. And then thirdly, remember God's promise of hope, which provides for future blessings. I'll never leave you, neither will I forsake you. Can I live on that? Yes. Can I die on that? Yes. How do I know that he's going to come through? Because he's been coming through. And if he did it then, what would cause him to walk away and leave me now? If he put up, and, and, and this is me, if he put up with me then, why won't he put up with me now? Amen? And I always look at it figuratively as in terms of human relationships. Again, my grandchildren... If I put up with them last year when they just about ran me crazy, I'm going to continue to put up with them. 
And maybe some of you might think, boy, he showed us talk about his grandchildren. I wonder, does he really love them? Yes, I love them. I tell you what, if I don't love them, start messing with them. And you see how much I love them. But they still get on my nerves. And ain't no use of me pretending. I ain't got perfect grandkids. You ain't got perfect grandkids. All of us have sinned, fallen short of God's glory. We have to be frank and realize that what somebody else is going through, yes, they are not single out. They are not the only ones on this universe. All of us who are part of this clay journey, all of us will go through these trials. But going through these trials, we got to remember him. Jesus Christ. Now, we just got through celebrating with the choir, right? Now, we reach the point that we're going to start commemorating. Why should we commemorate? Because he has commanded us to remember what he has done. He has commanded us to remember why he did it. He has commanded us to keep him in our hearts because he said, I'm coming back again. And because I'm coming back again, to, to validate the fact that what I told you, I'm not just spewing some type of words out of my mouth, but I'm going to back it up. And I'm going to back it up with me and when I come back, you're going to see me, and it's not going to be in terms of a weak lamb that has been slain from the foundation of the world. It's going to be as a conquering king from the tribe of Judah. And I'm going to come back with all my force, with all of my army of angels, and I'm going to judge the earth. And everybody is going to realize that I am a conquering king. Well, do you believe it? That's what it boils down to. Do you believe it? Notice that Matthew says his name means he came to save the sins of the world. Now, let me give a clarification at that point. God never said that everybody is going to be saved. Why? Some people will reject him in spite of everything that he does. They're determined to go to hell. They don't care. They can read about him. They can have facts about him. They can read this book from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, it doesn't matter. They still will not receive him as Savior. And one thing that he is adamant about, he doesn't force salvation on anybody. He says, all who what? Believe. Believe is something that I must respond to him. He gives me faith to believe in him that he will save me and give me eternal life. But because he has given me freedom to make my own decision, I can decide to accept him or reject him. Now, the question is at this moment, when the invitation as it is given, what is your decision if you are here and you have not accepted him? And you've been rejecting him. And maybe you're saying, Preacher, how have I rejected him? I haven't, I haven't had any conversation with him. I really don't care anything about him. I'm trying to get my own life together. I'm trying to make my plans for the future. Well, do you know that your plans are not your plans? Do you know that any time if he chose to, he can abort destroy. He can eliminate your plans. If he wants to really 
bring you to him, he can do you like he did the prodigal son. He can bring you down to a hog pen. He can bring you to your senses. And you'll realize that the only place that is home is where daddy is.